set me in place, set me in place, and I'll never grow cold. Set me in place, set me in place, till it's all that I know. Set me in place, set me in place, and I'll never grow cold. Breathe, come and breathe on the coals of my heart. Your fire started.
Such a land is this for me Such a land Such a land Such a land is this for me This is she
think as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still into love 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 your good good father to Two. Thank you for your love. Thank you for being our good father. Thank you for being all that we need. Lord, I I I don't have words to express how much we actually need you and how much we need you for each breath that we take and God help us to realize that more that we would understand in every moment we need you so much. And you are a good father. You're not going to leave us. You're not going to abandon us. But you're patient with us, waiting for us to call upon you. And Lord, help us to do that this morning. Help us to recognize your presence in our life. Help us to allow you to do the work that you want to do in us and through us. And have your way. Have your way in this service and in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, ladies, and welcome to Grace Fellowship Online. Uh, today's the fourth Sunday, so it's couples fellowship. So if you're a couple, you're very welcome to join uh, our couples fellowship online. <coughs> Excuse me. Online is a Zoom meeting. You can get a link from Jimmy or Carol Lynch, and they'd be more than happy to have you in their fellowship because it's, a, it's a, just a good way to know, get to know the other couples in the church it's a nice discussion together and uh so it's at four o'clock today and if you have time to to um to join them uh feel free to do that and i know they'll be happy that you joined and i know that you'll be happy that you did so with that let's take out our friend to friend cards and let's pray for our friends that haven't yet come to know jesus and pray for ourselves as we open up God's word today. Let's pray. Father, thank you for those that we know that haven't come to know you yet. Thank you that you've placed them on our hearts to pray for, and Lord, we lift them up to you right now. We ask that you would do whatever it takes to bring them into your kingdom. And Lord, if you'd like to use us, we're available. So just let us know what to do. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. And Lord, we thank you for your word. We ask that as we open it up, that it would truly be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, that we'd hear more than the words that come out of my mouth, but that your Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts and that we would leave this time as doers of your word, not just hearers. And we thank you for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, open up your Bibles to John, sorry, 
First John chapter three is a big difference. First John chapter three, we're going to start with the first verse and read through verse 10. John speaking, and he says, See what great love the Father has given us, that we should be called God's children. And we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it didn't know him. Dear friends, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. <coughs> Excuse me. You know that he was revealed, <coughs> Excuse me, so that he might take away sins, and there is no sin in him. Everyone who remains in him does not sin. Everyone who sins has not seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who commits sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the devil's works. <coughs> Excuse me. Everyone who has been born of God does not sin because his Seed remains in him. He is not able to sin because he has been born of God. This is how God's children and the devil's children become obvious. Whoever does not do what is right is not of God, especially the one who does not love his brothers or sisters. And we'll stop there. So, He, said, he makes some statements in there, and, and, and sometimes it, it brings condemnation to people. He says in there that people who love God don't sin. But if you, if you look at it in the original language, he's really talking about, you know, that's our, that's our aim. We've talked about this before, but the way this is worded might make somebody feel like, Oh, I still sin. Am I a Christian? Well, if you're aiming at sin, you might have a problem. But if you're aiming at doing what God wants you to do and you mess up from time to time, you're just a human. So what he's talking about is habitual sin, sin that we go for as what we're aiming for and not just a mistake that we make. So what he's really talking about here, he's, he's beginning a discussion that concerns being children of God or in another context, bearing fruit. He's actually addressing the problem of habitual sin, or a lifestyle of sin, if you will, or walking in darkness. John here starts out saying how wonderful the love of God is that he would call us his children. Now the thing is about children, children's a very good analogy, because actually God has God created us to be his children. But uh, as an analogy, children resemble their parents in so many ways. They behave like their parents, whether they want to admit it or not. Um, so Christians should resemble their fathers. They should bear fruit that looks like him. I went over to Scotland uh, when I was playing in a band over in Europe. And I met a family, I mean, a, whole, a big family of cars. And if you don't know, my last name is Carr. And I could tell I was related because they looked like my family. You know, all, all my family had this little, you know, widow's peak thing and Stuff like that. I mean, some of them don't, but, you know, and there's there's certain facial features and, and stuff that just looked alike. And I, I just thought it was incredible. I, I didn't have to be told that they were related to me. I could tell. And the same should be about us and God. Uh, people should be able to tell. Oh, no, not facial features 
characteristics. But by the fruit that we bring from our lives, the character that we have in our lives, that should show people that we're children of God, whether we tell them or not. Sometimes we're happy just to masquerade as one of God's kids. We're happy to only look like him and him superficially and in church and whatever. God wants to do a deeper work than that in our lives. Look over Matthew chapter 7. I'm going to be reading in the New Living Translation. Matter of fact, all of my references today, I think except one, are going to be in the New Living Translation. Matthew 7, starting with the 15th verse, says, Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit, that is, by the way they act. <clears throat> you can, can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit. And a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. We can identify people by their behavior. By their fruit, you will recognize them, another translation says. By my fruit, you, you recognize my parents. I've already told you uh, several times, but my family has this look that we have that when we get upset. And uh, Chase calls it the look of death. I don't know if he still calls it that, but he did when he was 15. <laughs> but... Um, the truth is, by my fruit, I, mean, I have that look, passed it on to Whitney. She's going to pass it on to her kids. It's just a characteristic. I mean, you know, I'm one of those guys that if you want to know how I feel about something, you can just look at my face. I can't hide it. Um, so I'm not really a very good liar because... Uh, you can see it all over my face if, um, if, I'm, if I'm thinking something or feeling something. So, <clears throat> Matthew 12, 33, Jesus says a tree is identified by its fruit. If a tree is good, its fruit will be good. If a tree is bad, its fruit will be bad. If we're walking around and we're producing bad fruit, and we're going to talk about the specifics of that in a minute, we're a bad tree. Because in Jesus, the maturity of a Christian is not measured by the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's measured by the fruit of the Holy Spirit. See, Jesus has done all these things, he says, so that in him we might bear much fruit to the glory of God the Father. It is, God's, it is to God's glory that we behave like him. And the main characteristic of a Christian, the main fruit that a Christian should bring from his or her life is love. We should be loving people. We should be kind people. That word kindness has been rolling around in my head for months now. It's been a focus of mine. Kindness, kind, kind, kind. So I kind of <laughs> want to talk about that. Anyway, Matthew 23 is a chapter where Jesus is yelling at the Pharisees. <laughs> and it says in Matthew 23, verse 25 and 26. What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites? Tell us what you really think, Jesus. For you are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy, full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisees, first wash the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside will become clean too. 
I think I've told you this story before, but I, when I was on the road, uh, me and the bass player of the group, uh, Stuart Peel, stayed with this lady in Seattle, and she was very old, and she was a bit senile. And so she, she called me Dan and him Steve the whole time we were there. <laughs> Obviously, my name's Don. His name is Stuart. <coughs> but uh, anyway, we were Dan and Steve to her. She, sweet lady. But in the morning, we were uh, having breakfast. And I had my cup of coffee as usual. And as I drank down to the bottom of that cup of coffee, there was lettuce from last night's meal in the bottom of the cup the quite gross and um, the outside of the cup looked really nice but the inside of the cup had leftover food in it and I don't even think it was from the night before his meal I think it was from before we got there because we didn't have hot drinks the night before so it was really gross that's what Jesus is saying that these Pharisees are like. On the outside, they look great. But once you drink down to the bottom of the cup, there are really nasty stuff in there. Somebody else's leftover food. That's gross. And, and, and people might be saying, but so-and-so is such a good teacher. So what? But so-and-so has such a dynamic personality. Who cares? But they have signs and wonders. Who cares? The, the question is, what fruit is coming from that person's life? If they're a great teacher and they're you know, exhibiting godly character, wonderful. Listen to that guy. But you know, if they have a dynamic personality, but they're really mean and hateful, don't don't follow that guy. See, follow the fruit. You know, in investigations, it is said, follow the money, right? Especially in political investigations. Here, it's follow the fruit. Follow the character of God. That's what we want to follow. That's, that's what, because that's what we want to be like. I want to, I want to emulate a person who is good at emulating God. I, I want to have godly character and I want to follow somebody with godly character. So maybe some of that will rub off on me. Does that make sense? I mean, I don't want to pretend. I don't want to watch some guy who has godly character pretend and do things the way that person does because we're pretending to be like him. No, I want God to do a deep work in my life so that I will naturally, fruit is natural byproduct, so that I will naturally behave like Jesus. Am I making sense? I hope I am. John 13, 35, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. That's pretty clear. That's pretty clear. The, the, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. See, people aren't naturally loving. Oh, they'll act like they love somebody in order to get something. That's totally opposite of what love is. Love is loving somebody just because you love them. You choose to love that person just because you choose to love them. Same, same reason that God loves you and that God loves me. He loves us because he loves us. And there's never going to be a time that God doesn't love you. And so if you don't spend eternity with him, it will break his heart. But it'll be your choice, not his. God loves you. And see, we should be that same way. We should love people. You don't necessarily love what they do and, and, and telling somebody that they are uh, behaving in a sinful manner, that is not unloving, unless you do it in an unloving manner. <laughs> but it's <coughs> telling somebody they're wrong when they're wrong is actually 
an act of love most of the time. Like I said, unless you do it in a mean way. Oh, I hate you because you do that. No, Christians don't hate people. I love you so much that I'm going to tell you that what you're doing is wrong because you're hurting yourself or you're hurting another group of people. And I love you too much to let you continue hurting yourself and others by this behavior. Does that make sense? That's the only reason to tell, to, to, you know, bring up somebody's wrongdoing. Is because they're hurting someone and you don't want them to hurt anybody else. Maybe they hurt you. And you're like, oh, hang on to this. No, don't hang on to it. It's not, it's not worth it. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. See, Samuel was going along because God told him to go to a particular house and one of, the, one of the boys there was going to be the next king. And so he looks at you know, the oldest and he's big and tall and looks like, looks like what a king should look like. <laughs> I mean, what's a king supposed to look like? I mean, Prince Charles is, you know, <laughs> is that what a king's supposed to look like? I don't think we would pick him. But God says, you know, I've, I've rejected this guy because his heart's not right. He, he's, he's, he's not, I don't know if, if he was a terrible guy, but it wasn't the guy that the Lord picked because the one the Lord picked had a, was a man after God's own heart, David. But to look at David, David wasn't particularly big, wasn't particularly handsome necessarily, at least not at that point, he was still a boy or a teenager. Probably had zits because he's a teenager. I don't think you're going to pick a pimple-faced looking person as king by outward appearance. A lot of guys got zits. Gross. Looks like a pizza face. Um, Jeremiah 17.10 says, But I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives. I give all people their due rewards according to what their actions deserve. So when, when looking at our actions, God takes into account a little bit of what the actions are, but he mostly takes into account our heart and our secret motives. See, we think we have secret motives when we do certain things to get something from God, but God, God knows our heart. He knows our secret motives, so you can't pull one over on God. So God's going to give us rewards according to what, you know, our actions deserve. What actions came from those secret motives? Not the actions that we do to try to impress people. You can impress people with stuff like that because we, we can't see your secret motivations. But we don't impress God with that. God's going to get down to what we really are and who we really are. Psalms 139, 3 and 4 says, you see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I am going to say even before I say it, Lord. God knows what we're going to say even before we say it. And the interesting thing, combine last verse with this verse, and God, you know what I'm going to say, and you know why I'm going to say it before I ever say it. So the, the, the bottom line is, just be honest with God. And, and, and as a matter of fact, just be honest with yourself. See, Jesus wants to do much more than just teach us how to be good girls and good boys in front of a crowd. We all know how to behave properly in church. Or I'll say at least most of us know how to behave properly in church. But he wants to produce a certain kind of fruit in our lives. So what is fruit? 
Fruit is the natural byproduct of a species. Children take on the characteristics of their parents because that's the fruit of their parents, a natural byproduct of their parents. I'm not going to have children that look like my neighbor. My neighbor is Hispanic. He's going to have and does have children that look like Hispanic kids. I'm not going to have kid a kid that looks like a Hispanic kid. I'm going to have Whitney. She doesn't look Hispanic, but she's beautiful as a little white girl. Although she's not a little girl anyway. She'll always be my little girl. But in Matthew 12, 35, it says, A person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart, and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. Is it evil? Or is it a Diet Coke of evil? Not quite evil enough. Well, let's take a look at what the natural byproduct of, of being a person is. The natural byproduct of the flesh. This is the stuff you don't have to work at doing. It just comes out of a person who has not surrendered their life to Jesus Christ. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Paul speaking, he says, When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. So this is a person following the desires of the sinful nature, the unregenerated, unsaved person. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Anyone living that sort of life, anyone that's aiming at these things, is not going to inherit eternal life. If I'm walking through life and I'm just looking at every situation that I could possibly get angry at, I probably need to draw a little closer to Jesus. If I'm, if I'm like the world and I'm just focusing on sexually immoral behavior, and that is my lifestyle, I probably need to look at my relationship with God. That's what these are telling us. These are, the, these are the works of the flesh. This is the natural byproduct. This is the fruit of walking, not in the spirit, but walking in the flesh. I didn't say it, Paul did. I didn't say it, God did. If you have a problem with that, you have a problem with God. Because grace is not a license to do all of these things and then just ask forgiveness later. Jesus wants to change me. Jesus came into my life to change me so that I wouldn't be slave to sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, and so forth. He wanted to change Don's nature deep down inside. He wants to change me. He wants to change you. Now it says, in contrast, in Galatians 5, 22 through 23, these are the natural byproducts of the Spirit. Paul speaking again says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, which is the main one, and I believe it's, it's named first because this love produces all the rest of them. So it's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. So what... Jesus wants to do is 
change a person that's been doing sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. He wants to change that person into a person who's producing love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There, there's a huge dichotomy between those people. Isn't there? There's a huge difference between those people. And he wants you and me to be the second one. What kind of, what kind of, what kind of produce? <laughs> what kind of fruit? I guess that's produce. What kind of fruit is being produced from your life? Do we... Sometimes have that outburst of anger? Or is that my lifestyle? Is that who I am? Do I sometimes fall into jealousy? Or is that who I am all the time? Do I sometimes have selfish ambition? I think that's a big one in the United States these days. Selfish ambition. That's a work of the flesh. Do I sometimes cause division? Or is that my lifestyle? Or is my lifestyle love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? Self-control. Self-control. That's a big necessity these days, self-control. Hey, let's go burn down the city! No, let's have self-control and not do that. See, these are, these are naturally what's going to be produced, so you can't really hide it. A tree can't hide its fruit. It's, it's there. And you recognize what kind of tree it is by what kind of fruit it's bearing. Are you a Jesus tree? Am I a Jesus tree or am I a sin tree? That's the question. You know, you go, you go by an orange tree, you see the oranges, you can smell the oranges in an orange grove. And you pick the orange and you eat it and it's, it's good. Go buy a grapefruit tree, you know that it's a grapefruit tree. Go buy an avocado tree. You know it's an avocado tree. Why? There's avocados on it. You go buy a Jesus tree. You know it's a Jesus tree because it has love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You go buy a sin tree. You know that because it has all those other things that are being produced from it. I want to be a Jesus tree. How about you? And you know what? God wants you to be a Jesus tree. He wants you to bear much fruit. So now the question comes, how do, we, how do we start bearing good fruit? Well, like I said, it's a natural byproduct. In Christ, these things will naturally occur. The interesting thing is, I, I, I know a couple of kids who were adopted. And I mean, I know several people that are adopted, but I'm thinking about a particular couple of kids back in Tallahassee that, that were adopted. And the kids started behaving and even resembling their adopted parents. Have you known people that resemble their dog? <laughs> if that can happen between a dog and an adoptive parent I mean it, it does it, this, this, uh, especially the young lady uh, developed a lot of, a lot of qualities of they, they looked like their adoptive parents I, I, actually both of them I mean not, not exactly 
But they develop, uh, I don't know how it happens, but they develop facial characteristics, probably not really the way they look, but the way they express themselves, you know, the, the, the looks on their face and, and stuff like that. You start getting that from the people that you're around, right? There's, there's you know, you, you, you start hanging around somebody who's your best friend, you're going to start laughing like them and, and all kinds, you know, you'll, you'll pick up phrases that you and that person say, stuff like that, right? Have you met people like that? It's not strange that the more we hang around our Heavenly Father, the more we hang around Jesus, that these things naturally occur in our lives. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Have you allowed Jesus to make you brand new in him? It doesn't say anyone who belongs to Christ might become a new person. This is a, def a definitive statement. Anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. So now, live your new life. Stop living in the flesh and live the life that Jesus died to give you. That's what we need to do. We need to start acting like we're God's kids. Instead of agreeing with the world all the time, we need to agree with God. John 15, verses 4 through 8, says this. Jesus is speaking. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. Does it say might produce much fruit? Or does it say will produce much fruit? He says those that remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So how much can you do apart from Jesus? Nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile and burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. See, we bring great glory to the Father by bearing much fruit. See, these, these branches that don't bear any fruit, they get cut off so that they don't waste nutrients that are coming up through the vine because they're not producing any fruit. Let it go to the, the branches that are producing fruit. Does that make sense? But it says if, we're, if, we, are, if we remain in him, if we're attached to the vine, if we're attached to to Jesus, if we're hanging on to Jesus, we're going to produce much fruit. God's going to change us from the inside out. That is the promise that we have from God. That if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Let me read it the way the NLT says it again. I like it. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ, do you belong to Christ? Then you're a new creation. You're a new person, has become a new person. The old life, the ways of the flesh, those are gone. A new life has begun. We just need to live it. This is not a, a maybe this will happen. This is not a maybe if I remain in him, I will bear much fruit. It's not a maybe, it's I will. If, if we remain in him, we will bear much fruit. So how do I, 
How do I bear much fruit? By hanging on to Jesus. In Galatians 5, 16 through 18, Paul speaking and he says, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. That's the key right there, that one sentence. Let the Holy Spirit guide your life. Let the Holy Spirit guide my life. Not my feelings. Not follow your heart. No. Follow the Holy Spirit. Because the heart is deceitful above all things and no one can tame it. Beyond cure, it says. Let the Holy Spirit guide your lives, then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. So if I'm finding out what the Holy Spirit wants me to do, that's going to be opposite of what my sinful nature wants to do. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. See, if, 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 if I'm following the Holy Spirit, I don't need to memorize the law and try to make sure that I'm following the law because the Holy Spirit is not going to lead me to do something that is sinful. See, it's much easier than trying to memorize what the law of Moses says. God's given us a new system to obtain the same righteousness. Am I making sense? So I, I simply pay attention to what the Holy Spirit is leading me to do. And when I get that holy inside of me, I don't do that. I do what leads to peace. See, the Holy Spirit is going to lead you into peace. Whatever God tells you to do is going to be accompanied by peace. Whatever the devil's trying to get you to do is going to be accompanied by stress and anxiety and all that kind of stuff. Follow the Spirit. And we'll produce much fruit. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verses 6 through 8, so letting your natural, excuse me, for letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. See, when I'm going out and doing what the sinful nature wants me to do, that thing that comes natural to those people who are walking in the flesh, I can't please God. And in fact, when I'm doing that, I don't want to please God. We decided, because... We surrendered our lives to Jesus. We decided, you know what? I want to please God. Didn't you, when you prayed the sinner's prayer, didn't you ask for forgiveness of your sin? And you asked Jesus to come into your life and be the Lord of your life? That means and be in control of your life. Right? Isn't that what you prayed? That's what we pray here when, when we lead somebody in the sinner's prayer. And so you've surrendered the control of your life to Jesus. Don't take it back. Don't take it back. You came to Jesus because your life was in a mess. And you didn't want to just have some superficial, hypocritical existence after that. Right? You wanted for Jesus to actually change you. Is that not correct? Is that correct? Then let's let him. Let's not be children of the flesh. Let's be children of God. Romans 8.11 says, I'm reading this out of the NIV, 
And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. See, the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in every one of us who has surrendered to him. And if he can raise Jesus' dead physical body from the dead, he can give life to our mortal bodies because of that same spirit. That same spirit lives in me. And he can give me a godly life in Christ Jesus. Am I making sense to anybody? So the question is, what's being produced from my life? Do those who know me become acquainted with the love of Jesus and the fruit of the Spirit, or do they become stronger in their walk with Christ and more determined to follow him? Do they see my Father? Can they tell that I'm a child of God? Or do they become acquainted with envy, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition? Are they encouraged to become more like the world instead of more like Jesus? Which one? Which one is you? If it's the latter, be determined to walk according to the Spirit and remain in Christ. The closer we get to Jesus, the more we will see the natural byproducts of the Spirit flowing from our lives. Remember, it's natural. You can't just start to, oh, i got to be more loving. I need to be in peace. Um, no, it's, it's a natural byproduct. It's not something we work up. As we draw close to Jesus, these things will naturally grow in our lives. We're children of God. Hang out with our Father, and, our peop and, and people will see him in you. You see, the, the, the question that, that I have with so many people who, do, who, they're supposed to be Christians, but you mostly see ungodly character. I, I started asking them, how much time do you spend with Jesus every day? Do you read your Bible every day? Do you talk to Jesus every day? Do you listen to what he has to say, or do you live your life by how you feel? Are you following your own heart? We need to simply draw close to Jesus every single day because he bought us. He owns us. And that's a good thing. We're his children. We're God's children. Let's start looking like our father. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you have created us to be your children. But somehow our enemy, the devil, has kind of tripped us up and somehow we're, we, we're born into sin and we follow the flesh as a natural thing. Lord, today I pray that if there's anybody who has prayed the prayer of salvation but is not looking like you, I pray, Lord, that that person would decide that they're going to draw close to you every day. They're going to read their Bible every day. They're going to talk to you every day, all through the day. Yes, have a quiet time, but have that running conversation with you all through the day. Because as I include you in my everyday life, I'm not going to do the things that the devil wants me to do. So I pray that, that we will all follow your spirit because your spirit only wants what you want. Help us to do that, Lord. Now with everybody's heads bowed and their eyes closed, how many of you would say, you know, when you read that list, I, I think I look more like the second one instead of the one that's following Jesus. If, if that's true, and, and you've got to be honest, don't be a hypocrite. Admit it. If you look more like the second list, let's ask God to help us draw close to Jesus and 
to look more like Him. Because He's the only one that can do that work in your life. Like I said earlier, you're not going to be able to just work it up. So with everybody's heads bowed and their eyes closed, how many of you would say, you know, I, I look like the second list, but I want to look like the first list. I want God to do that work in my life. And I'm willing to start making sure that I spend the right amount of time, whatever that is, with Jesus and in his word. If that's you, could you lift up your hand and put it back out? Yeah, I know I can't see you, but God can. You're making this commitment to God, not me. Anybody else before we pray? Lord Jesus, I thank you for each person that lifted their hand. Lord, we come to you because we have failed. We, we seem to follow the ways of the world instead of following you. Somehow how we have gotten off, offline and we haven't been spending time with you like we should. And so, Lord, we repent of that. And we ask that you would help us to spend the kind of time with you that would make us start looking more like you, make us produce fruit so that the Father can be glorified. Lord Jesus, I want to seek you with all my heart. Lord Jesus, I want to know what your word says. So help me to accomplish that. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. Don't forget Couples Fellowship uh, Zoom meeting at 4 o'clock this afternoon. Uh, I'll see you on Wednesday. God bless you.